Varmt välkomna till Studio Access eh, där vi ska prata om Storbritannien. Eh, och, eh, det är ett ämne jag ska tackla tillsammans med min gäst Fraser Nelson eh, som är chefredaktör för Spectator, en, en brittisk eh, veckotidning om politik, samhällsfrågor och kultur. Varmt välkommen Fraser. Jättekul att vara här. Du talar lite svenska. Ja, jag kan tala lite svenska, men inte så bra. Jag, jag, jag har en svensk fru och jag försöker prata svenska hemma. Så. Okay, but we'll we'll switch to yes, English. Yes, probably yeah. safest. Okay, we'll do that. Uh, we won't be able to uh, uh, avoid Brexit. We'll mm. come back to Brexit. And, and one of the effects of the outcome of the of the British referendum on EU membership was that you got a new prime minister, mm. uh, Theresa May. Who is she? It is quite extraordinary that the Brexit vote was about the EU and yet it was seen as a mandate for a new Prime Minister with a new direction. It hadn't even been barely been a year since David Cameron's historic majority mm -hmm. and going in a certain direction. When Theresa May comes along thinking, OK, I'm going to use Brexit as my personal mandate to go a whole new different direction. Now this surprised a lot of people. Nobody really thought that Theresa May would be the Prime Minister. We thought George Osborne or maybe Boris Johnson. But no, she was the most resilient um, candidate and the exigencies of the internal Tory party machine means that she is now a Prime Minister and one who even Brits don't know very much about. She doesn't like talking very much. She likes to keep herself to herself. She has very few friends politically. Mm -hmm. She isn't one of these people who has a tribe around them or who wants to articulate a vision. She's perhaps one of the most private uh, government ministers I've ever met. She has very little small talk. She likes to be defined by what she does rather than what she says. And she has taken power at a very, very delicate time. She was for Remain in the referendum. Mm -hmm although she was wise enough not to actually campaign for it. So that means that the, the leavers in the Conservative Party can more or less accept her because she was seen as being an unenthusiastic Remainer. But she has dropped all of that. E even a closet Brexiter? Well, probably. People's, she did what, what people expected Boris Johnson to do, to go through the motions of, of backing the Prime Minister but without any enthusiasm. Um, so. You know, I don't think being in or out of the EU is that a, that big a deal for her, really. But she has taken the so what, what's now regarded as the social causes of the Brexit vote to heart. That if you look at who voted for Brexit, mm -hmm. disproportionately, they are people who are poorer, older, less educated, who feel the world is developing in a way not to their advantage, mm -hmm. and that they wanted to change course. They won't thought that any course would be better than the course we're on. So Theresa May has seen in this a kind of a personal manifesto to dedicate her government to people who felt they were being ignored and who used the referendum to make that point. Now, of course, that isn't all that was behind the Brexit vote because 52% of the country voted for Brexit. But she wants to... Um, but what she has succeeded in doing, and I think this is really quite remarkable, is killing populism stone dead. Britain does not have a populism problem anymore. There's one in Sweden, there's one in France, there's one in most of European countries. But in Britain, we've just got, well, the British National Party. They're the only kind of racist party. Their vote went down by 99% at the last general election. Then you have UKIP. Now, some people might regard them as, as populist, but they are now disintegration. They've lost Nigel Farage. They're struggling to win by-elections, their support is going down. Organisationally, they are dissolving. Um, and the Conservative Party is proving rather popular. And I think this is a, offers a wider lesson to some other countries in Europe, that this is how you ha tackle populism. If you respond to people's concerns, populism tends to go away. Now, she has taken a very different vocabulary, a very different form of politics earthier. She has started to say that um, she doesn't like the global elite, people who go to Davos. She thinks that they're citizens of nowhere, you know, taking very hostile language. Um, and as if she doesn't, it is as if she doesn't really believe in there being a left and a right axis anymore. She thinks there's another axis with cosmopolitanism at one angle and then, I don't know, something at the other, the Daily Mail, populism, call it what you will, but Theresa May is there. So her politics is more cultural than it is 
economic. She's sending these signals about, but it's, but it's okay to have pride in your country, that patriotism ought not to be a dirty word, and that you can have a government which, is, which does not worship at the altar of globalization, but still protects free markets. Now, it's a very difficult combination here, especially to those abroad who tend to see in Brexit Theresa May and Britain pulling out, pulling away, pulling up the drawbridge. But she has gone to great pains to point out in two recent speeches, one at Davos, one in Britain before that, um, that her aim is to reinvent Britain as the world leader in free trade. At a time when protectionism is back on the rise in France and the United States, Britain will stand committed to free trade like we were in the 19th century and will try to create a network of other countries who also believe in free trade. Mm. Now that is her mission. I mean, many threads here. Mm. Uh, one issue might may be a, a sort of a, um, the distinction between substance on the one hand and style on the other. Because when you say that you have the cosmopolitanism on the one end of a scale and you have the Daily Mail on, mm -hmm. on the other side, and you have, I definitely say that Daily Mail is a very populist mm -hmm. newspaper, but you say that. Theresa May is there, yes. but she's not a populist. Well, so, so that's uh, that's an interesting distinction that you can take care of those kind of worries or or um, those um, uh, engage with those issues that that audience is interested in without going down populist alley. Mm -hmm. I think what um, what. The, the, her, ex her experience so far of her short premiership is if you go, if you persuade people that you're listening to what they have to say, that you don't reject their concerns as being bigoted or xenophobic, that if you talk in a language that is more, that is more in common with neglected voters than it is with the metropolitan fashionable elites, mm -hmm. then that goes a long way. You don't have to come up with policies, you know, banning immigrants or anything like that. All you need to do is to basically say to people, I hear your concerns. I mean, let's look at David Cameron. He actually, I think, did, did quite a good job here as well. He was, nobody expected him to win a majority in 2015, but he did. And he had a policy of cutting immigration by two thirds. Now, he completely failed in that target, but the fact that he had that target counted for a lot because it meant people thought at least he wanted to control immigration. And there are a lot of parties in Europe right now, and governments in Europe, who wouldn't even say that they want to control it. They think that that is dark territory that we don't want to go down. Mm. Now, it's funny. But are you saying that this is only psychology? That as long as you say the right things, people will appreciate that, and and that I'm not actual results do not really matter. I'm not saying it's only psychology, but I think a large part of it is empathy rather than psychology. It is trying to say to voters, "I'm on the same wavelength as you." I understand your concerns, they are legitimate concerns. I mean, the concerns people have about immigration are all usually very, very rational. Where are these people going to live because housing is quite constrained? Who's, where are they going to go to school? What impact will they have on the labour market? Will they mean my job is going to be le less well paid? Mm -hmm. What about my children? Will they struggle to find a job? You need somebody to engage in that conversation. And when you do engage in that conversation, it, it goes a very, very long way towards establishing trust with the electorate mm -hmm. and taking away the idea that nobody will listen to them apart from Le Pen and people like that. Mm -hmm. um, and this has al always been the British way. If you look back to 1979 when Margaret Thatcher was elected, I was watching the election night coverage the other day, that's a sort of sad person mm -hmm. I am, but um, they had all these experts talking about the National Front who were expected to do very, very well in the 79 election. The National Front were a sort of, you know, a, a BNP, um, uh, uh, well, national. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they were yeah. basically racist, xenophobic. Yeah. They looked to be doing very well, but they were Thatcher destroyed them that night because during the campaign, she came out with a very controversial statement that Britain was being swamped by immigration. Now, the word swamped was very controversial, was very ugly. She got a lot of criticism for it, but the people who were going to vote National Front saw in Thatcher somebody who was using language that suggested she shared their concerns. And it's just amazing how far that will take you in politics. David Cameron utterly failed to control immigration. 
But people who were concerned about immigration thought he was on their side, that he shared their objective, even though he wasn't able to achieve it. So when it comes to fighting populism, I think this is a very important part, the language which you use and the extent to which you can empathise with your target voters. I mean, an obvious question now, now that you've mentioned Margaret Thatcher and you have mm. yet another female prime minister, what similarities are there? Not very many. Margaret Thatcher believed in ideas, in principles. She would take out Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, slap it on the table and say, this is what we believe to her colleagues. And May wouldn't do that. She doesn't have much in the way of ideology. No, she has instincts, but she doesn't believe in ideas very much. She takes from left and from right. Mm -hmm. Some of her ideas have actually been very, since quite, quite protectionist, actually. Mm -hmm. She wanted, for example, to have a new law which would restrict foreign companies taking over uh, um, the British ones. She thought that she's mooted the idea of ha forcing companies to list what percentage of immigrants they've got in their workforce. Now, Thatcher would never do this. And May, to her credit, dropped these ideas pretty quickly. They're very, very bad ideas. They are protectionist ideas. They're ideas that, um, that belong in the 1970s. But when we try to work out who is Theresa May and what sort of person is she, one of the things that we've learned is that she is somebody who will drop a bad idea, although her initial instincts were more protectionist than they were free market. In her mind, the, the villains of her world are certainly people like George Orsborn, who was a great believer in globalism, who wouldn't hear a word said against it, who thought that if you didn't like globalization and then you were harking back to the past. She disliked that form of merchant banker politics because she thought it gave a sense to the conservatives being on the side of the rich and the elite and abandoning the poor. Um, so Thatcher was a great believer in, in principles, there was such a thing as Thatcherism. Mm -hmm. I don't think there will be such a thing as Mayism. May, Theresa May is about a style of government rather than the principles and direction of government. Some commentators have stressed her that she likes to do things in a formal, correct fashion. Yeah. You, you actually discuss things at meetings, uh, not, uh, not at night uh, over drinks. Well, home. that's only half true. I mean, it's certainly, um, uh, I went to see her in number 10 recently and um, when I went to see Cameron, he had a sofa in the corner and that's how he liked to do his business, sofas. The sofa had vanished. There was a table with some chairs. It was quite formal. Um, but when it comes to discussion, she isn't actually that good at discussing things openly with her colleagues. She doesn't quite like debate. She prefers to go out of the room and talk to her special advisors and discuss things with people who she trusts. She doesn't, her circle of trust is very small, really. There are about two people in it. Okay. Um, and Nick Timothy and um, Fiona Hill are two special advisors. Um, so she's very slow to trust other people. So it's not the case that they come and collectively decide what the, but she does believe in formal protocol. There are a lot more cabinet subcommittees. Mm -hmm. I was just tol telling you earlier about the idea of um, restricting who can take over British companies. Now that was killed off in one of her committees. She had an economic affairs subcommittee, which she chairs. Mm. She had the chancellor, the business secretary, the Brexit secretary, and they were all saying to her, you must be crazy, prime minister, this idea, this is, look, look at the French, they used this national interest test to try to stop Pepsi Cola taking over Danone, and that's a yogurt maker, there's no national interest in yogurt. Mm. This is why we've laughed at the French for 30 years, we can't do this ourselves, we're British. And she allowed herself in that committee to drop the idea. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say there was discussion, but not only did she create the committee, but she respected the dynamics of that mm -hmm. committee. So she allows herself to be talked out of positions in a way that Gordon Brown wouldn't have, and David Cameron probably wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I would say it's more, for, more formal, less discursive, but certainly quite encouraging, actually, from what we've seen so far. In an interview, um, when you commented on, on the Brexit result, the leave result of the referendum, you, you said that it'll be difficult for the Conservative Party to reunite mm. after this campaign. Uh, how have the things turned out? This think? has been the giant surprise that the Conservative Party, who are at each other's throats, ready to tear each other apart throughout the campaign, have united so quickly so completely. We've just had um, vote after vote after vote in the House of Commons about triggering Article mm -hmm. 50. And during that vote, the Conservative Party united. It was incredible to watch. You had Leavers and Remainers, 
sitting next to each other in the benches, chatting. And it was the Labour Party that was split by the Brexit vote, not the Conservatives. There were four front bench resignations from Jeremy Corbyn's team. Um, as in this Brexit, there were no resignations from the Conservative Party. So what has happened is this. Tories, sure, they might disagree with each other, but fundamentally, we are leaving the European Union and nobody seriously disagrees with that. So the, in a way, there's nothing to fight over anymore. The other thing is what Tories like most of all, more than sovereignty, is they like being in power. And they look at Jeremy Corbyn and they see a man who's going to let them be in power, not just until 2020, but probably until the middle of the next decade. If they can keep their act together, if they can keep it together somehow, then they can get perhaps nine more years of power. Now, the, that is an incredible inducement for any political party to bury their differences and try to work together. Mm. And I think, strangely, Theresa May, is um, she commands the respect of MPs. She's seen as a very solid, dependable, she's not flamboyant, she's not serious. very personable, but she's oh. serious and she's honest and she does what she says she will do. Mm -hmm. So you don't see any of these factions anymore. Now, there were a few rebels, the sort of the Cameronites, but these are people like, you know, Nicky Morgan, the former education secretary, George Osborne, they're not really cut out for the art of, for being political guerrillas, you know? They, they're far more likely to leave Parliament to join a merchant bank than they are to stay in the Conservative Party and fight and try to disrupt. The people who really cause trouble, they're all in the government now. David Davis, Liam Fox, mm -hmm. the Brexiteers. They are the people you don't want as your enemies and they're now on Theresa May's side. So, strangely, the, the coherence of the Conservative Party has surprised even Conservatives. I, uh, there was one Tory MP who was saying after the vote on Brexit that he's enjoyed this night more than any other night apart from his wedding night. You know? yeah. and, um, Talking about sad life. Yes, yeah. it, but, this, <laughs> but the thing is for a lot of these Conservatives, yeah. this is all of their Christmases have come at once. <laughs> they have got, we're leaving the European Union, Labour is a mess, and the future seems right now mm. to have nothing other than conservative rule. Uh, talking about the Labour mess uh, under, yeah. Je under Jeremy Corbyn, that's a p I, I found a piece on your, uh, on your blog, the Spectator blog, uh, uh, well a piece of news actually about the new poll showing mm -hmm. that la the Labour Party is not the biggest and now not even the second biggest party among working class voters. Mm -hmm. The Tories, uh, Tories are almost twice as big. Mm -hmm. And UKIP is also bigger. Yeah. What's happening to the Labour Party? Well, this reflects three trends. Firstly, Theresa May's success in winning over working class voters. If you look at where the Conservatives are the most popular now, the answer used to be in, in the rich south of England. Now they're most popular in the north and in the Midlands around Birmingham. So a very different demographic is, um, is being uh, picked up by Theresa May. Next, you see UKIP trying to supplant Labour mm. as the party of the working class in the same way that the Scottish Nationalists. Have so tr instead of trying to hit the Tories, they're trying to hit Labour. Yes. Yeah. Their new yeah. leader, Paul Nuttall, has explicitly said this. Mm. He has said, this is what UKIP's going to be from now on. Forget about the Tories. We are going to be the old Labour Party. And he's right to identify this as the greatest single opportunity for, for UKIP. Because look at Jeremy Corbyn. There are two strands to the Labour Party, and there are most left-wing parties. You get the kind of... Um, the intelligentsia, the fashionable people who believe in isms mm. and who would do anything for the working class apart from actually like them. You know, that's the caricature of, um, of the, kind of the um, Islington elite. And then you get the, the, the trade unions, the working people's movements, um, and they tend to have less fashionable beliefs. They tend to believe in Brexit, while the cosmopolitans tend to believe in Remain. Now, Jeremy Corbyn, he, he is most excited by things like the politics of uh, Israel versus Palestine and you know, sexism and various causes. He isn't particularly interested in the language or the priorities of the working class. And Labour is slowly beginning to lose its connection with these communities. Now UKIP is basically saying, look, this, this populism, Euroscepticism, it worked for a good time, but now let's just try and supplant the Labour Party because we look and talk like them. We come up with the values that working class people do. We can show that we care about them when the Labour Party doesn't. So there's a race right now on there. You can see it in the race for the various by-elections in Britain. The problem is that UKIP is so badly organised that it struggles to prevent a coherent front. 
The Scottish Nationalists are very well organised and they have supplanted Labour. Labour is now down to 14% in Scotland. And as a Scot, I never thought I would live to see the day where Labour were, you know, almost as unpopular as the Conservatives. They have one single MP in Westminster. Yes, so proud, yeah. one single in MP. From Scotland. Yeah. Yes, as, uh. as do the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and all the rest are Scottish Nationalists. But the implosion of Labour in Scotland is, is a phenomenon and the big question is, will it be followed by an implosion in England? And right now, I think if the UKIP were stronger and if they were slightly organisationally more coherent, they would be able to do this um, because Labour is there for the taking. It's a bit like metal fatigue. You never see the signs of strain until it finally snaps. And Labour might be about to finally snap, but we have four years until the next general election. And right now, Labour are like bed blocking, you know, where a, a, a proper opposition party. Labour are too strong to fail, but too weak to succeed. They're in this limbo under Jeremy Corbyn. The party have tried to dislodge him, and they can't, because two thirds of Labour Party members joined the party in the last 18 months. They're Corbynistas. Mm -hmm. For the first time in European politics, we've seen the takeover of the membership of the party. We've seen the takeover of leadership before, but never of a membership. No, I mean, that's very interesting. I saw a graph the other day where the, the Conservatives do relatively poorly when it comes to membership, while the uh, Labour has had a huge Oof, influx of new, of new members, mm -hmm. which has been disastrous yes. <laughs> for, for the electoral uh, prospects of the party. Yeah, this is one of the many trends that we didn't see coming. We, we thought that nobody joined political parties anymore, but then the Scottish Nationalists, prove everybody wrong after the independence referendum. Mm -hmm. You got a huge sign up of support for the SNP after they failed to win the independence referendum. And then, so these are the mechanisms you use are basically social media. You can, mm -hmm. you can talk to people saying, you can, you can talk to your tribes very easily on Twitter and Facebook. Very d so if you were politically organized, and all of the far left people dotted around Britain were able to unite, join the Labour Party and put in Jeremy Corbyn. And their objective is not to take power in Downing Street, their objective is to capture the Labour Party. So these people are happy at the result. They're not unhappy. Mm -hmm. Corbyn's doing badly. They're happy that he's there in the first place. We have to give a few minutes to, to Brexit. Yes. Uh, but before that, just briefly, is there room for any other issue really in, in, in British politics? Uh, it's funny, I was talking to a government minister about this yeah. the other day saying, you know, what about education policy, what are, you know, things that I'm interested in. And he was saying, look, talking about education policy now during the Brexit negotiations is like talking about agricultural policy in May 1940, you know, yeah. that we have got one issue here to, f to, to win this battle, to get Britain out of Brexit. So much depends on getting this right. So anything else would be a pointless distraction. So, but, and most people, I don't know about you, but most people seem to think that this Brexit process will go on for quite a while. Mm. Article 50 uh, is supposed to be, uh, which is part Two of years. the Lisbon Treaty, uh, yeah, is supposed to be invoked in March, and then yes. the, 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 it states that negotiations must be finished within two years. Mm -hmm. And Theresa May has said that she wants all negotiations, basically, with the EU to be finished in two years' she time. Does. Do you believe that? Yes, I do, and I'll tell you really? why. Really, really. Yeah, you uh, no, you're, tell, I mean, you're the first one I meet. Yes, because yeah. you know, because the thing is that it, in, in 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 Brussels they're saying, "Oh, you must be joking. Look at the legal complications. There's no way we can get this done in two years." But they forget what is very important for Theresa May. She does not want to have a general election in 2020, with Britain still having not left the EU, because if she does that, she can't go after May 2020. That's the absolute maximum. And if Britain's still in the EU then, then the election becomes another referendum campaign. And then the Labour Party gets a lot more support than they would otherwise get because they become the party of Remain. Yeah, but membership will end before uh, 2020 if Article 50 is invoked in, in, in well, March. Well, is it in March 17? But, but then, then two, two years will be March 2019. Yes. And yeah. so, so look, it might drag on a little bit, but not for much after that. I mean, say, for example, they, they, they come to something, but it's been, it has to be ratified in various parliaments. Oh, yeah, well, okay, There's yeah. all sorts of mechanisms. You know, we might get the Walloons in Belgium trying to um, you know, just stop the whole thing again. Yeah. But I think that she, she will not let this drag on because she cannot let it drag on. Mm -hmm. She is more prepared, I think, than people realise, mm -hmm. to walk away, to say, right, we've tried to negotiate. 
But you can't do it. But w if, if, do I get this right? What you're saying now is that the actual exit negotiations will be finished before 2020. Yes. But then there are all kinds of other negotiations. Oh yes. Trade, uh, new trade deals, newer trade arrangements. And yes. Uh, and so, 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 so right now our default position is WTO rules. Yes. So at any point we could do that next week if we wanted to. You know, there is no nothing legally stopping Britain um, walking out. Uh, but by all means, you know, it would be good, good to try That's this. That's the so-called hard Brexit. Yes, not a word I like to use because uh, I, I regard this as a clean Brexit rather okay. than a, a, a hard Brexit. But I personally, I, I struggle to imagine the EU doing a deal with Britain. I think the EU is in not a psychological position to agree to such that something as important as this. I can see somebody holding it up in a veto I cannot see this ending very well at the moment. And it, I think it, will, it could well be done in stages. I mean, for example, if the negotiations don't go the way that she wants, she could pull out, go to WTO rules, and then try to opt back in on a piece by piece basis on various things if the EU will have it. Now, uh, right now, you might think, well, this is impossible. There's no way that the, um, you know, the, the, that's Brussels would allow it. But then again, remember, these things are reciprocal. So if we put up a 10% um, a tariff on cars, mm -hmm. then Britain is Germany's number one um, customer for cars. The Germans won't like that very much. There is huge incentive for reciprocal free trade agreement. This is what we want to, Britain, Britain wants to conduct. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, and also just think of what might happen in the next two years if Madame Le Pen becomes president of France, for example, and we say it's crazy, but think of all the crazy things that have happened recently, then the EU will have far more difficulty in its hands than a, a deal with Britain. So um, it's strange, but I, do, uh, I basically think, uh, think that Theresa May will be prepared to walk away. I don't think she'll be thinking, well, if I don't get a deal in two years, then I'll give it three years or four years. Now, there will be transitional arrangements. And of course, the ideal is that Britain gets all of the trading benefits of being in the EU without any of the bureaucracy. And um, that's the best case scenario. The base scenario is WTO rules with no formal agreements at all. The deal will be somewhere in between those two points. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's not really up to Britain to work out where it's going to be. It's going to be up to the, you know, the, the 27 other members of the EU. And given that they've got to agree um, unanimously, I think it'd be very difficult to do. So the thing, we're not really sure about this because even I, the trade negotiators that I speak to in London, they're sitting trying to read frantically to work out how is this going to go. Nobody's really done, done it before. Article 50 was never really intended to be used um, because they say now two years and this is an impossibly tight time frame. But Theresa May is working to a deadline of May 2020 and she cannot afford to let it stretch beyond We've that. We've almost run out of time, but I have to ask you one final question, which is about the United Kingdom. Will mm. the whole United Kingdom remain united in, in, the, in this new scenario? Scotland, Northern Ireland, will they remain uh, parts of the United Kingdom? Yes, I think they will. If you look at support for independence, it's now back down to where it was before Brexit, it's about 45%. If a nationalist wanted to call another referendum, they'd have to be about 60% in the polls, to because uh, they know if they lose two, it will be like Quebec, game over. The oil um, price has really hit Scotland's prospects for financial independence, and uh, the, uh, the domestic record of the SNP is catching up with it on the education and especially. Um, so my suspicion is that um, you know I, I, I can't see it getting any stronger. Um, Nicola Sturgeon is a very effective Prime Minister. She's very good at making out that Scotland is just desperate to get out of, um, out of this union and, and it's really shocked at the, at the Brexit. But two in five Scots voted for Brexit. About half of English people voted for Brexit. The difference is significant, but it's not night and day. And I think most Scots would want to stay in the single market of the EU. They prefer that. Sorry, of the UK, than trying to leave the UK for the single market of the EU. And be readmitted to the EU. Which they couldn't be anyway because no. the deficit is so big. And what's more, the Spanish wouldn't allow them because if they know the Scots do that, the Catalans and the Basques will be next. Mm. I mean, Scotland will be vetoed. There, I don't think this will really. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the Union and about Britain in general. All right.
Fraser Nelson, thank you very much. Tack så mycket. Och tack så hemskt mycket för att ni har tittat.